Hello, Hello, nice welcome. Nice welcome to the fourth edition of Lums Live. Um, just a quick reminder before we begin our discussion for the day: if you've missed past sessions of Lums Live, they're available to stream on the Lums Facebook page as well as on YouTube. So please go and check out these very important conversations with some of Pakistan's best and brightest. Today's discussion is on the future of Pakistani democracy, state, and identity. Um, I got the idea for this panel while I was reading a new book on Pakistan called *The Nine Lives of Pakistan* by New York Times journalist Declan Walsh, who joins us today. Um, in his book, Declan threads Pakistan's recent history into the biographies of some of the people he met during uh, almost 11 years of reporting in Pakistan. So he looks at the life of uh, perhaps Pakistan's bravest and best-known human rights activist and lawyer, the late Asma Jangir, who fights for society's most marginalized, takes on everyone, including the security establishment. Uh, there's Karachi's famed police investigator, Chaudhry Aslam Khan, a divisive figure, sometimes called Karachi's Dirty Harry, the cop who would do whatever it takes to keep the peace, um, and who himself ultimately um, got killed in an attack in 2014. There's a chapter on Salman Taseer and his war against the right wing, championing the cases of Pakistanis victimized by the blasphemy laws, um, who was himself assassinated by one of his own guards in a killing that, as Declan asked in his book, raises the question of who was the good Muslim, Taseer the reformer, or Mumtaz Qadri his killer? Which Islam is Pakistan to follow? And finally, there's a very intriguing chapter on an intelligence agent whose job used to be to follow Declan around on his assignments and who finally provides some kind of answer to why in 2013, he, uh, on the eve of an important election, Declan was suddenly given three days to leave Pakistan and was never allowed back. Uh, I felt that through this diverse cast of characters who present um, all these different facets of Pakistan, it's creeping um, uh, radicalism, it's misplaced nationalism, it's uh, political fault lines, it's ethnic conflicts, the personal bravery and idealism of its people. Uh, through these characters, we had a picture of a land of so many riddles and so many com contradictions, and we could come together here and talk about the question of what is Pakistan and where is it going? Because even the most basic questions about this country are still bitterly contested, as Declan notes, by so many Pakistanis. So what are Pakistan's foundations? What kind of state did Jinnah, the founder, actually envision? How did the manipulation of history in the service of nationalism serve the country's present and future? How has the relationship between state and religion defined Pakistan's politics? What is wrong, if anything, with the form of democracy we have in Pakistan? Uh, do we need a new system? Why are civilians and generals constantly at odds? And for a country whose future prospects are so hotly debated and whose demise is so frequently predicted, what is the glue that holds Pakistan together? Uh, why is Pakistan always on the brink, but thankfully never fails? So these are all huge questions, I know, and uh, would probably require many books to answer them, but we'll try and mm -hmm. answer some of them with the help of our panel of very distinguished guests today who all have their unique, um, very important vantage points from which they see Pakistan and its many problems and solutions and can perhaps help us navigate this really complex country a little bit better. So um, in no particular order, we've got with us today Declan Walsh, who is the Cairo Bureau Chief of the New York Times, prior to which he covered Pakistan for 11 years until 2013, when he was summarily expelled on account of what the authorities uh, called undesirable activities. We'll talk about these activities later in this talk. Uh, since then, Declan has covered the wars in Libya, Yemen, Syria, the revolution in Sudan. Uh, he's covered Egypt. He's covered the US presidential election. In 2017, he won a Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award. Uh, he's also the author, as I mentioned, of the newly published The Nine Lives of Pakistan and is returning later this month to Kenya to take up a position as chief Africa correspondent for the New York Times. We have with us Jugnu Mosin, is a co-founder with her husband, Najan Sethi, most famously of the Friday Times. She's worked as a TV host on some of Pakistan's top channels and comments frequently on current affairs for various TV channels and newspapers. She's the recipient of the Press Freedom Award given by the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York, and as well as the Sitara Imtiaz. She's a trustee of the Mosin Trust, which works in health and education in Shergar in Okara, which is her hometown. Uh, in 2015, she successfully put up a panel of grassroots political and social workers as independents in the local bodies elections. And in 2018, she contested the general elections as an independent candidate from Okara and won. 
So we'll talk in detail with her about her work on the grassroots, how that's important for Pakistan. We have Naseem Zera, a national security specialist, a journalist and an author. She has degrees from Qaeda Azam University, the Fletcher School at Tufts. She's been a fellow of the Harvard Asia Center. Uh, she's a visiting fellow of, at Qaeda Azam University, NUST at the School of Advanced National Studies at Johns Hopkins. She's also served as the Pakistani President's Advisor, Advisory Committee on Foreign Affairs and National Security on the Kashmir Committee and as Pakistan's Special Envoy on UNSC reforms for Canada and Latin America. And I am Mehreen Zara Malik. I'm a journalist currently, um, editor of Arab News, a major Middle Eastern newspaper with a background reporting for various uh, 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 newspapers, the New York Times, Guardian, Reuters. In Pakistan, I've served as deputy editor of the news, as news editor of the Friday Times, and I'll be the moderator of today's discussion. So I'll start off with you, Declan. Um, the first chapter of your book is called Inshallah Nation, which I believe was originally meant to be the title of your book. I remember attending a birthday party for you in 2010 or 11, when there was an Inshallah Nation cake. So would you tell our listeners a bit about why you cho chose to call Pakistan Inshallah Nation? Uh, is it perhaps because the phrase Inshallah is a comfort blanket in the national psyche? Or is it because in Pakistan, you know, people often use the term in a more non-committal way when they want to put something off or when they have no intention of doing something, they say Inshallah. Why did you choose this phrase? Uh, thanks, Mary. It's great to be here and it's great to be in the company of uh, uh, distinguished colleagues and old friends. Um, when I sat down to uh, start thinking about writing a book, uh, you know, the, the big question really was um, how I was going to present Pakistan and what I was going to try and explain about the country and what I had felt that I had learned. Um, and I guess one of the first thoughts I had really was that, you know, there were so many different, uh, so many different Pakistans that I'd met while I was there. And um, I was sitting in my house in Islamabad chatting with a friend about what sort of you know, title we might come up with. And it really, you know, she, she brought up the idea of Inshallah. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that, you know, here's this word that I was hearing all of the time and that actually meant different things in different contexts. So, you know, it seemed that Inshallah could be, uh, you know, it could be a no, it could be a maybe, it could be a prayer. It was used by politicians. It was used by ordinary people. It meant so many different things. And in a way, I felt that this was kind of um, emblematic of, you know, the many different faces of Pakistan and also this element of uncertainty about where it was coming from and where it was going, particularly at that time, which, as you uh, point out, was, you know, nine years ago. And at that time, Pakistan, things obviously have um, settled down greatly now, thank God. But at the time, it was a very turbulent period where there had been a lot of violence, you know, in Islamabad, close to my house, as well as across the country. Um, and so, you know, it was really a time of intense soul searching, I think, in the country about where to come from or where it was going. And for me, Inshallah was a word that, you know, summed that up a little bit. All right. Um, uh, Jugnu, I just so kind of, is Jubnu there? Yeah, yeah, I'm right yeah. here. So Jubnu, I wanted to talk to you a, a little bit about the, um, uh, sort of broaden the discussion. Uh, we'll come back to your book, Declan, in a bit. But I wanted to talk about the political party structure in Pakistan. Um, so here, many of the major political parties, as you know, are dynastic, right? From the Muslim League Nawaz, the People's Party, even the National, uh, you know, Awami National Party. So to what extent do you see this as a major hindrance for Pakistani democracy flourishing and how does it stunt the growth of a more organic grassroots politics of the future? I don't really see that as the problem, Mehreen. I don't see that as the problem at all because it's very organic, if you like. You use the word organic. Uh, I think that ancestral politics, dynastic politics is organic, organically linked to this um, country and its uh, development, its history, its culture. Uh, the voter finds it perfectly acceptable to vote for uh, the leader's daughter or the leader's son uh, or the leader's brother uh, or a kinsman. It's perfectly natural in uh, the tribal feudal um, setup of uh, rural Pakistan and even urban Pakistan. So in fact, there's a, a strangely a level of comfort with kinsfolk rather than with outsiders. 
unless the outsider has a radical message which appeals to people and appeals to them viscerally in terms of their interests and in terms of their well-being then they will opt if they believe in the outsider otherwise i think people uh, cling uh, very comfortably to the notion of successors dynastic successors uh, in in politics so it's But perfectly organic that is not the hindrance Hmm. no but doesn't the, the the dynastic nature of it then create this kind of patron client relationship which uh, you know hinders the development of a more of, a, of the of political culture outside of those families well you know mehreen if you look at the political parties that evolved in pakistan many of them have evolved uh, because they've been um, they've been oppressed and repressed because they've been hunted and frequently you'll find that it's relatives and mostly daughters and sisters who stand up for their fathers or their brothers mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know it's amazing to me that leadership roles are gender neutral in pakistan when you mm-hmm. see women are so discriminated against uh, against in this society which is a really patriarchal society when it comes to leadership roles women who succeed their fathers their brothers are perfectly acceptable to people and um, frequently political parties are, are are you know so what shall i say pushed to the wall and so discriminated against because the state is so averse to sharing political power mm. that you only have descendants who are ready to you know stand in the line of and in the line of fire and people accept this they know this to be a truth a given truth and so mm. fatima jina was her brother's legitimate successor and uh, a very very brave woman and she won that election had it not been for general ayub khan's gerrymandering um mm-hmm. benazir bhutto was her father's legitimate successor uh, mm-hmm. in the eyes of the people and that is what matters uh, mm-hmm. maryam nawaz sharif is the legitimate successor of her father in the eyes of the people asfandiyar wali khan is the legitimate successor of khan wali khan who was the legitimate successor of khan abdul ghaffar khan and so it goes on and on and it is because these political parties are born uh in 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 the belly of fire that uh, it's only relatives who will stand in the line of fire people feel who are actually then committed to the cause of their brothers or fathers etc so that is not the issue that is not what what um, uh, what stunts democracy what stunts democracy are other things that a top heavy state which does not let politics flourish and develop organically that in my view is the hindrance All right, we're going to talk about that in detail. Um, Nasim, I wanted to speak to you just because we're talking about political parties. I wanted to speak to you about what's happening in Pakistan right now, and then try and tie it to the larger problems. So we have this alliance of opposition parties right now, uh, which is threatening to topple the government with a religious party leader as its head. Um, in the past, we've seen that mainstream political parties had, to a great extent, their own street power. But now we see even left-leaning parties like the PVP. and of course the pmln is part of the uh, you know uh, um, uh, part of it as well they're kind of bowing down before the right wing because they need its ability to bring people out on the streets and you know these are parties that have in their own way taken on the right wing in the past right benazir bhutto died at the hands of radicals um, major military operations unpopular military operations against taliban militants were launched during the government of nawaz sharif so how do you see what is happening now this embrace of the right wing politically how damaging is this for in the long run for pakistani democracy um thank you very much couple of things i just want to make a brief comment on what dubnu said i think while i agree that um while i agree that um the issue isn't really i mean pakistan's problem on the political evolution front doesn't have to do with the fact that uh, you know daughters and sons take over from uh, you know take over leadership of the party but uh, i i don't agree that you have that it's just daughters and sons etc who are willing to stand in the line of fire i mean you look at political parties uh, across the country whether it's people's party whether it's anp etc i mean people uh, who don't necessarily belong to the family uh, f- uh, to the ruling family have been um, out there fighting for a cause so i uh, i mean i think that while again that isn't uh, the only cause um of uh, lack of political evolution um uh, dynastic politics i don't think is the only 
way forward. Dugnu is right in saying that these are all born in the belly of fire and the establishment and the army is so, you know, it has such an overbearing uh, impact on politics and the way, um, you know, political parties and political governments function that you end up uh, being in an embattled uh, mode and their uh, families come forward, but so do other members of uh, political parties. Coming to your question, I think that um, uh, clearly, uh, right now, the main consideration, the main consideration for the opposition is to be united, number one, and two, to be united in a way that they can bring out street power. Street power is very critical. And as we can, as we know, street power is perhaps uh, Molana Fazlur Rahman is, is the person most of the political parties in opposition are depending on. And hence, uh, him uh, being the convener, the overall head of PDM doesn't surprise me. But yes, the question that you ask is an important question that in terms of the texture of Pakistani politics, in terms of the content and the ideology of the Pakistani politics, you do have um, uh, then an injection of the right wing um, outlook. But let me uh, add here that it doesn't remain static. I mean, I think that this current uh, phase where the PDM has got together and you have Fazlur Rahman Sahib leading them, I think it's temporary and it's, uh, it's really um, objective specific. And the objective is to somehow, uh, you know, uh, challenge the government, somehow shake the government out of complacency to be out there and, you know, really challenge the government in a comprehensive way. So um, I don't think that this phase in any way is going to dilute whatever People's Party believes in. I don't think it's going to dilute whatever PMLN believes in. I think it's temporary and it's transactional and it's objective specific. Uh, I think in, and therefore, um, I think it's in a sense understandable. All right. Um, Declan, you've written about the outsized role of religion in Pakistani politics, how emotional an issue it is for the public. Uh, how it's been manipulated time and again by politicians and, you know, the security establishment. You dedicate a whole chapter to the Red Moss siege, to the killing of Salman Tassir, etc. Uh, yet in Pakistan, we also see that religious parties are not able to win at the ballot. So in your own experience of Pakistan, when, you know, you were reporting here or your understanding of the country, how important do you think religion and its relationship with the state has been in shaping Pakistan as a country? Uh, or do we exaggerate the political impact of faith? Oh, no, I think it's hugely important. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of different things going on there. Uh, you know, it's certainly true that obviously the uh, religious parties, particularly the Jamaat, have scored, um, you know, fairly poorly in most elections. And, you know, I, I don't know, I can't remember what they got in the last election, but typically they only get a fraction compared to the, you know, not, not non-religious parties. Um, but that doesn't mean that Islam or Islam as an identity is not important for, for many Pakistani um, uh, voters. But when I think what, when you take that, put a, that aside and then look at, for instance, the issues of blasphemy or the issues of, say, militancy as, you know, came up through the Red Mosque and then followed through for so many years afterwards with, you know, the Taliban and other people, other militant groups that used religion as um, a vehicle for their extremism and for attacks on civilians and the military and many other people. Um, that, that's actually, I see that in a sort of different category. That's in the category of the state and its relationship with religion. Uh, you know, the state, the Pakistan military is traditionally ambiguous and sometimes supportive rule towards certain militant groups. I think, uh, I, I argue in the book, has been very um, destructive for the country. And then in terms of blasphemy, um, you know, I was when I was in Pakistan, I was really um, the, one of the reasons I devoted a chapter in the book to Salman Tassir was that, you know, for me, this was a very dispiriting moment in the period that I lived in Pakistan when he was killed, not just the fact that um, his own bodyguard felt emboldened to kill him, but also in the reaction that came afterwards from people who either supported, openly supported the action of uh, uh, of uh, of his his body of his his assassin or people who felt afraid to speak out against him and to me that became a moment in my personal attempt to understand the place you know where you saw these huge uh, um, 
you know, a, a sort of what I felt almost like a weakness in society. Um, and that, of course, you know, goes back to part to the very roots of Pakistan and its identity in an Islamic country, but specifically it also comes from the instrumentalization of Islam, uh, you know, starting really from the era of General Zia, who took the blasphemy law and turned it into a, uh, a you know, and, and I'm sorry, turned blasphemy into a capital offense and sort of turbocharged it as this tool that could be used by powerful forces to prosecute their grudges against all sorts of people. And, it, you know, watching Pakistan from afar for the last number of years, um, you know, in the same vein, I must say it has been really, um, you know, disturbing and disappointing to see that this blasphemy issue has only gotten worse. And I was, uh, I saw that video uh, from July from the young man who killed uh, a defendant in a court in Peshawar, I think, or Charsada. And, um, you know, he, he spoke on video afterwards about how proud he was to have done that. Um, and then a couple of months later, we see another a Pakistani immigrant who's gone to Paris and who carried out an attack outside the offices of the satirical newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. And again, his father stands up and says that he's proud to have done it. And so for me, I felt that this really raised a lot of, um, you know, urgent questions about, uh, uh, you know, the, the role, how these uh, beliefs have become so large in the minds of so many people, but also critically, I think, in the role of the state in, uh, you know, controlling, in manipulating this or in controlling it. All right, um, uh, Jugnu, I wanted, let's, let's talk a little bit about, we're going to come back to, uh, you know, uh, the role of religion in a bit, but let's talk about um, parliamentary democracy in Pakistan. We've seen how uh, corruption erodes it from, uh, you know, right from the top to the bottom. We see, uh, you know, the kind of priorities the state has had and, you know, where people have been denied their basic rights like education, health, employment. We've seen the state of the police, the bureaucracy. Do you still believe in this system? Well, there is none other, Mehreen. There isn't another system that can work in a pluralist, um, complicated country like Pakistan with layers and layers of history and ethnicities and religions and sects, etc. So there is really no other system that we can rely upon. And we've tried the other types also. We've tried authoritarianism, light, L-I-T-E. We've tried draconian martial laws. We've tried everything and failed and mm. really if this system is allowed to function and grow and improve organically yeah. from as it has done all over the world, it will deliver something. It will deliver the goods to the people. But as yeah. it stands, as it is, it's a very yeah. broken system. And yeah. uh, it's a system that is very compromised from, as you said, from top to bottom. Yeah. And when I say, uh, uh, you know, top to bottom, I mean that in the Zia era, really politics became all about money because uh, money was employed to break the people's will, to deny the, the, the mandate of, the, of those who had actually uh, got the people's votes. And uh, this became now then par for the course. And then members of the National Assembly of the Shura to, to begin with, when Zia's rule started, and then the members of the National Assembly were all given dole outs by the state. And uh, the dole outs, Mehreen, I have to tell you, are a form of political bribery because uh, people spend money on their elections and then they make it back twice, three times, four times and they build properties for themselves and they become devotees of the political parties that dole them out. And it has to be said that all the public health works and all the development works, the roads, etc., that are built through the money that is given to these MBAs and MNAs, you know, a, a big proportion of that goes into the pockets of, of the, the very politician who are supposed to represent the people. And then you get sub substandard um, uh, works, public works and civic works happening on the ground. And so the vicious cycle continues. But um, the problem is, the, is, is this, that, you know, people would vote for better people. Mm. But the problem is that put the political parties, because they're so hamstrung, uh, they mm. want people to contribute to their funds, to the party fund, this, that, mm. you know, they try every rule in the book, that they break every rule in the book to be able to stay in politics via money. It takes, it takes a lot of money. It's a very expensive hobby to stay in politics. So this, this corruption from top to bottom continues. 
but if the system were left alone mehreen if the system were allowed to function and we could have peaceful hand handover of power every 5 years without without any uh, you know manipulations and if the media on the one hand and the judiciary on the other were also you know left uh, were not meddled with those would be the pillars of the state that would be keeping the politicians in line and their corruptions in line so i'm afraid you just have to stop meddling if you want things to improve the state has to stop meddling and let us grow organically and the same just to take forward what jugnu just talked about how how do you think we can make it work uh what is the role as she mentioned judiciary media what's the role of other institutions um how do we make parliamentary democracy work in pakistan yeah before we uh, you know move to that subject jugnu's election um itself and then i think she had uh, other people in the local body uh, election and i think there were other people besides herself who she put up as candidate candidates and they won despite the fact that you know she was uh, fighting the election pretty much on her own in the sense that you then realize that the public in terms of the voter is very conscious of you know what's what works and what doesn't work and uh, so jugnu's example is a good example we haven't focused on that in terms of when you have competent people i mean Uh, she hasn't spoken about what all she's done because that's not what we are discussing here but the hard work that she put in over the years and the level at which she was functioning grassroots level how she brought in other people i talk about it because i know it at some length that's a, a terrific example that tells you that when the organically linked politician i mean borrowing from branches organically linked intellectual when you take the organically linked politician you realize that he or she can actually uh, be out there irrespective of the kind of support they get or not from major parties and establishment they can still win on the religion part quickly marine let me tell you that if you go back to what happened during uh, nawaz sharif's uh, last um, few months when the tlp movement emerged we know where it emerged from and uh, just as faiz is still uh, dealing with that uh, fallout of what he said loud and clear so when tlp came and um, you know that nawaz sharif himself uh, on you know on the behest of his brother shabash sharif sab he actually fired his law minister if you recall and uh, you know some days later when the election was held who won from the law minister's constituency the law minister's nephew so the public had no issue the public and i mean going back to what declan said religion is really not something that uh, um, you know bothers the religion in terms of practicing it at a personal level is fine but look at look at the astuteness of the of the voter they didn't uh, not go for the law minister's family because they felt like he was you know he opposed tlp and whatever so that is one example and and um, um, sn ikbal sahab you remember he was shot at and um, and he was shot at by religious groups and he end up ended up winning so there is so much hope if you really let the system be now when you say how do we let the system be obviously you and i are not uh, um, meddling with the system so it's not a question of you know so what should we do the question is does the army understand i mean i think the big question now is how is the army viewing all of this the fact is that uh, that before the elections took place i mean that's for certain on the election day i can't say but on before the elections the major manipulation that took place we you know all know what happened in jaw we know how people moved parties etc so that's the kind of thing you don't want to happen um, let's go to then um, then the question of uh, how the judiciary functions i mean uh, if uh, imran khan was uh, keen and is clearly keen on accountability just imagine what is happening to the institutions why didn't prime minister imran khan leave the institutions to work on their own in an autonomous fashion there was so much interference and even if there isn't practical there, there is practical interference but look at the discourse look at the kind of um, political chat that goes on you know just it's as if the prime minister himself is leading the accountability um, you know the business of accountability and then 
what is this FIA, former FIA guy said, you know, look at the things that he said. So there's this, all of this interference going on. There's this manipulation going on. Just as far as Issa's case is an example, uh, right. you know, that NAB accountability. So all of that is there. I think ultimately the question is, it's very clear that until and unless there's a consensus all around, there's no way, I mean, the um, as long as the army doesn't understand that you've got to let the system be and the institutions have to function. I mean, whether it's the judiciary or whether it is the media or the parliament, there is enough going on. The digital world is the new reality that in and of itself uh, brings everybody to uh, account, you know. So, so that's the reality that if you let that function, if you let free press function, you will have ups and downs which society Right. He doesn't just, face all that. I mean, in some ways, Pakistan isn't a unique society. So, Declan, both Jugnu and Naseem have kind of tried to highlight what they feel are the major problems. What, you know, as an outsider, but also someone who studied Pakistan closely, what do you see as the biggest problem or deficiency in the political system here? Well, a couple of threads I just picked up on uh, from what both uh, Jagnu and Nassim were saying. I mean, on the issue of dynastic politics, I think it's certainly true that, you know, um, being part of a, a, a political dynasty is not disqualifying and for many voters is an attractive thing. But it is important, I think, to note that there, see, it seems to me there is a constituency of people in Pakistan who, you know, for whom dynastic politics has become something that they would like to vote against. I remember when Imran Khan started his rise to real popularity, one of his slogans was that he was going to you know, uh, um, you know, do away with the dynastic politics of the Sharifs and the Bhuttos and so on. And I think for, you know, some young, certainly as far as I could see, some young Pakistanis, particularly from urban backgrounds, you know, this was something that for better or for worse, and I think one can argue about the validity of the arguments that they found attractive. Um, you know, obviously, I think that there is for some people a a perceived, a, a real, in many places, a connection between some of those old, the old ways of doing politics and this issue of corruption. Um, you know, I agree with some of the other speakers that I think, you know, the place of corruption is often overstated or there is, um, you know, the patronage based nature of politics in Pakistan, where in most places, if you want to get elected, you have to spend money on your constituents and you have to, you know, and once you are elected, you're expected to bring the bacon home for people, if you'll excuse the, the phrase. And so, you know, I, th I think that there is, a, that, you know, there is an aspect to which, you know, politicians have certainly enriched themselves politically in Pakistan, but there are also, there's also an aspect to which voters expect them to bring home the goodies, so to speak. And that's a sort of structural issue that is, you know, really deep rooted and I think hard to tackle. Um, but, you know, I, the, the other aspect is that, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, I think that, you know, corruption and dynasty are, uh, you know, certainly factors, but I don't think that they are the real problem. And I think the real problem in, in Pakistani politics is that the system has just not been allowed to function, has been frequently interrupted by, you know, the military or people in the security establishment. And you know, those interruptions have cost the country dearly. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you want to look for structural issues, that's the one that has, you know, knocked the place back. And also it's not a, it's not a level playing field. I mean, I see, um, I've been following recently the trials of Nawaz Sharif and of course, uh, Asaf Zardari and the latest corruption cases. Mm -hmm. And it just, to me, it just seems to be so much of the same of what we've seen before. You know, I'm not doubting that there could be a valid case against any of these people in terms of how they made money or not. But the problem is that, you know, going back to when I was there, it was Musharraf used the Accountability Bureau against his enemies. And it just seems to me that corruption is this tool that is basically used to prosecute your opponents. Um, and, you know, if you're wielding corruption today, you'll be the victim of a corruption prosecution tomorrow. We've seen that over and over again, this kind of you know, nonstop corruption circus, where ultimately the goal of these corruption prosecutions is not accountability, it's undermining your political opponent. And you know, I think the day when people are able to step back a bit from that idea and see that, you know, like I said, I think there is an element of uh, you know, patronage, which in 
some places would qualify as corruption built into the system that people have to recognize. And secondly, I think that they have to, um, you know, uh, uh, take the long view and realize that, you know, corruption as an accusation only works if you apply it impartially. And if you don't, then it just becomes a political game. So to Naseem and uh, Jugnud, this is to both of you, uh, you know, just taking this forward, you know, these days we hear a lot about this hybrid system that is taking root in Pakistan. I think both of you have kind of touched on that, right? We have this system now, which combines autocratic features with democratic ones, right? So you have political repression, but you simultaneously have other elements of democracy still rolling out. So how do we get off this path? Is Pakistani democracy possible without this hybrid structure? And how do we kind of get out of this cycle? Can I have a go? Yeah, please. With your permission, Naseem. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, the, the solution, I think, is, as Naseem very rightly said, it is for the state to understand that you can't kill the goose that lays the egg. You just can't chop off the branch on which you're sitting. And this is what is happening. And uh, I think the, realiz the realization, uh, it, when the penny will drop when there are economic difficulties and that's what's happening now. I think this is perhaps the one, uh, we've had hy hybrid systems before, you mentioned a hybrid system, Mary. We've had, there was a hybrid system in Ziaul Haq's time. There was a hybrid system in Musharraf's time. There was a hybrid system in Ayub Khan's time as well. And this is the fourth. But this is the fourth hybrid system, which is not supported by US dollars and not supported now most recently by Saudi oil. So there is a difficulty here, isn't there? And it mm. is in time difficulty that people have to rethink their strategies. And that is what we're hoping for, that those who are very much part of this country, along with us, uh, should think about what the difficulties are collectively and think of the solutions collectively too. I think. It's, it's about time that happened. Hmm. All right, uh, Naseem, do you want to? Yeah, very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I don't see uh, that, you know, the economic uh, compulsions are gonna make uh, anybody rethink, uh, frankly speaking. I think we are going through a bad, very bad, and it's likely to get worse in the coming, um, you know, weeks and months. The economic situation, but I think uh, look at the other scenario. You've got a, um, a, a PDM is, is seen; it's reading itself for a head-on collision with the with the government. And the question is: uh, is uh, the prime minister um, you know, and uh, you know the army are they going to kind of rethink any of this without saying go easy on accountability? Is there going to be any um, ability or any kind of willingness? Um, in the present setup to engage with the political class. I mean, I think what is truly, uh, what is truly unique um, as we speak in Pakistan, in today's Pakistani politics is that the prime minister is not on speaking terms to the opposition. I mean, I never, I don't think that we've seen this in the past ever. You know, even dictators were engaging with uh, political leadership. So, and that generates its own tension, and that is obviously feeding into the kind of um, you know militant approach that the opposition is uh, is obviously uh, has adopted. So I'm looking really at that scenario right now, whether whether they're going to um, the the government sees and the army sees reason to engage uh, the army sees reason to encourage the um, the present government to engage with the political leadership the uh, you know the opposition because other than that if that doesn't happen and again i mean it's not a question that you engage and it means an nro it means like political engagement there are critical issues whether it is gilgit baltistan whether uh, electoral reforms etc can that happen and that's what will release the kind of tension that we see mounting up for now, or the other thing which is uh, important where the economic factor comes into play is, I mean, what happened four days ago outside the secretariat in Islamabad, this was unheard of. Literally thousands of people came out. They came out 
uh, there was eruption because of the economic pressures. I mean, that is one other likely scenario where you, uh, the economic situation can create chaos, not necessarily a change. I think a change will have to come from more, for, come from a more uh, thought through approach, which seems to be missing for now. Declan, what do you think, you know, sitting far away in Cairo, uh, watching Pakistan, not being allowed to kind of come back to Pakistan, do you think Pakistan is going towards a more authoritarian system? Do you think there's a slide backwards? Well, on, on some fronts, it's definitely slid backwards. When I, when I lived in Pakistan, one of the things that really uh, impressed me and that I embraced as a reporter was my ability to get around and to meet people and to have access and, you know, and, and, and to um, hang around with Pakistani colleagues who were writing stories to their heart's content uh, in ways that I found, you know, that were irreverent and that, you know, uh, criticized the establishment and all sorts of people. And, um, you know, I, I've been on, um, I've met colleagues when I was in London last year who came and we sat on a panel. Um, and, you know, uh, it was clear that things have really gotten pretty terrible for the, for the press in Pakistan. So that's one area in which it seems to me that things have really, re really slid backwards. And, you know, for me, I guess part of the question is looking at this in the, in the long run, uh, you know, the period when I was there, which was, you know, through the Musharraf years and the early years of the, of the post-Musharraf PPP government, um, was whether, um, you know, was whether that was an aberration uh, or whether, you know, the kind of crackdown we see now is actually the norm in Pakistan. And I, 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 I hope that this is the aberration, not that. And, and Jugnu, you know, you've been so, sort of two questions. You've been a part of the women's rights movement. You know, you've been a part of movements to uphold the freedom of the press. You, you and your family have faced the wrath of the state, you know, so just at so many points in history where, where one would argue things were much more worse um, than they are today, for example, during the Zia years. So how do you feel when you, you know, as you know, the activist in you, uh, you know, how do you feel when you look at how things are today? Uh, are we becoming more closed up as a society and as a polity? And then also maybe talk a little bit about why, why, why it is so that civil society and social movements are never really able to gain a foothold in Pakistan. Mehreen, I wouldn't agree that social movements um, and civil society have not been able to gain a foothold. I think it is because of the work of civil society that now in the deepest, darkest um, um, sort of uh, places of rural Pakistan, you have women standing up to say that, 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 that they have been raped and they have been, that other people getting up to say they have, there's been an honor killing. I think it is because of the work of civil society, indomitable people like the late Asma Jahangir, the late and great Asma Jahangir, that all these, the, these um, things that were so unusual at that time and almost sacrilegious have now become part of mainstream language, political language, rights language all over Pakistan. And um, if people are aware and whether, you know, the fact that these things continue to happen is of course extremely reprehensible and condemnable. But the fact that people are aware that this is wrong is, is because of civil society's engagement and civil society's struggle. And then you said that you know, um, has, has, um, what was the second bit? You said so that you're saying that in some ways, then things have improved that, that I, people are. And I'm also saying to you, Mehreen, that I agree with Declan, uh, and I hope this is not wishful thinking, but I think that our political class has behaved far more maturely than has the Indian political class, for instance. Now, India has had uninterrupted democracy an unadulterated democracy of 73 years. And we have not, we have struggled and struggled and struggled. And you know, it's always been two steps forward and one step back and 10 steps back and then six steps forward for us. But today you find that we, our political class is able to stand up as one and, and sort of, you know, despite all the differences and talk about rights and, and you know, lay the blame where it, it, it belongs and to speak you know, with one brave voice, I feel finally. And yet in India, it's, it's far more muddied in terms of what minorities' rights should be, what the state's narrative should be. Our political class is far clearer, I feel. 
and far more mature about what the state's narrative really ought to be. So I feel that uh, there is hope. I feel it's because of the struggles that we've been through, it's because of the troubles and travails that we've been through, that we are, you know, more, what shall I say, battle hardened, and mm. therefore more amenable, more we know how precious democracy and freedoms are. And uh, I think that is why we are more hopeful now, because we know, and because of the media, whether it's uh, now, uh, you know, a constrained media or not, and Naseem is right, social media is a digital world. Everybody has a phone in their hand and they have the world on their phone, even in the villages of Pakistan and people know what's what. So I think that is, that is something that we should, we should be um, happy about. I think that that's something we should be positive about. So no, I'm positive. I'm positive about the outlook. Okay. Um, what, what about you, uh, Naseem? I have uh... okay we, yeah 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 very quickly I think that um, uh, I think that in any case we are moving forward with all the problems we are moving forward and I think Imran Khan has made a contribution like all other politicians in creating a consciousness in this society I think right now I mean there's no question his focus on you know people who are the weakest in the society and uh, other things that he's trying to do in terms of fixed institutions you can talk about lack of experience and problems and kind of uh, you know, uh, trial and error basis. There are issues with the way things are happening. I think the major issue right now is the kind of relationship that there is between the government and the opposition and the absolutely deadlocked situation. That's the real crisis and the kind. And I think the other thing that we uh, are facing is that Imran Khan in opposition gave the sense as if everything was going to be kind of uh, minus a process. It was going to be instantaneous this kind of change and betterment, obviously that was not going to happen. And therefore, uh, between this, uh, between the rhetoric, the narrative where you gave the hope to the public that suddenly things were going to happen, that's a major problem. His, um, you know, his, uh, his attitude towards the opposition, which must be uh, taken through accountability, as should his own people be, but to have a kind of no talk policy with the opposition, I think that's a real issue. And the state, obviously, um, uh, the army, it seems, is uh, watching and reviewing and thinking. And just on a more positive note, I really want to say that the way we're dealing with our neighbors on the West is, is really positive. And the way, whether it's Afghanistan, Central Asia, Iran, etc., those are important uh, developments that are taking place. And also in terms of the army, if there was no NCOC, uh, we would have a more serious, we'd have a serious issue with COVID, the way Karachi is being handled. So the armies right now, and don't forget that um, the prime minister has put the army chief as part of the National Development Council. So, you know, the army is very much, uh, you know, in, in, in the frame and uh, part of the governance issues, etc. I'm I'm a chronic optimist. I think we will move forward from here. There will be a period of um, more kind of tension and crisis but there's no I think turning back and democracy is here to stay I don't buy this at all that you know the army is going to come and Pakistan's democracy whatever is here is going to move forward and we will move towards greater democracy. Declan um, also sort of carrying on with that theme it's been sort of customary in recent years you know especially in, in, in by western authors and the western press to describe Pakistan as a failing state, right? With its dysfunctional institutions, it's a weak economy, militancy, uh, the security establishment maintaining a grip on decision-making and yet Pakistan doesn't fail. What, what do you think is the glue that holds the country together? Well, I've always kind of objected to this failed state idea in the first place. I think it's a really unhelpful uh, phrase and and, you know, not a very constructive idea. Pe people usually use it against someone they don't like rather than as a critique of a country that's, you know, constructive or useful. Um, but, you know, what, what holds Pakistan together? I mean, the cliche, of course, is that the country's held together by Islam or by the army or uh, by cricket. Um, I think, uh, you know, in my experience when I was there, cricket was definitely a binding force for all Pakistanis. Um, I think the other two were more problematic for various reasons that we've, as we've been discussing uh, on this panel. Um, 
you know, I, I, you know, more seriously, I think that, you know, the, the period when I was in Pakistan, uh, which ended in 2013, and I continued reporting until 2015 on Pakistan, um, you know, that was a period where, which saw the rise of the Taliban and of militancy, and then the subsequent, you know, the start of the decline, and of course, thanks since then, thanks God, the absolute decline of, of that insurgency. And as an outsider, and I think for many Pakistanis, this was the, the great, you know, preoccupation at the time, what sort of threat this militancy posed to the country. But when I look back on it now, I, I, you know, I feel, and I look at the country now, I think I see these other forces you know, like the separatist force, the ethnic nationalist forces, you know, these movements that sprang up in Balochistan or in KP, um, you know, what's been happening the last number of years with the Pashtun movement, the PTM, you know, I think those are also, uh, uh, you know, real challenges to the cohesion of the country uh, where you have these groups who feel marginalized and feel alienated from the center, from Islamabad, and from what they see as this, you know, Punjabi dominated uh, uh, center bureaucracy and, and national security apparatus. So, you know, I, 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 I think when, when we talk about what's the glue that holds together, I think that sometimes it comes back to this idea of, you know, what does it mean to be a Pakistani if you are from Karachi or if you're from Khyber? And it's not for me to answer that question, but I think that, you know, in the end that becomes the litmus test. What do those people have in common? Naseem, you know, you've been seeing in the recent kind of last couple of weeks, of course, in the past as well, Pakistan's found itself at many points in its history uh, on a proxy battlefield between different powers, you know, whether it's US, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran. And recently, we've seen a little bit of, uh, you know, sectarian hatred rise once again. We've, you know, we've had these rallies and uh, speeches and, uh, you know, whatnot in Islamabad and Karachi. Uh, do you see these as something uh, as one of events or something more sinister? I mean, this, is this something to be afraid of? I mean, obviously, it's uh, certainly something to be uh, very concerned about. And I think the, uh, the positive thing that we saw in the last uh, uh, one week was that it was, uh, you know, it was controlled, it was contained. And at the end of the day, you had a code of ethics that came out, you know, from different groups that sat together and uh, is different sects sat together and we had the Chehlum I think is Chehlum is today and uh, it's been a peaceful affair from a time where it was threatened to be you know that the processions won't be allowed and it felt like uh, one sect was going was being pushed against the wall and also I mean that whole thing erupted because of mishandling at one level with one incident and that kind of snowballed. So the, um, it seems on that front, um, whatever their past and wherever these groups came from and whatever uh, forces they're connected to outside of the country or within the country, it seems that there is still a realization in the establishment within the state that you know these things can't be allowed to uh, snowball into something uh, deadly. And that's what we saw happen in the last one week. I mean, in terms of um, the you know, Taliban and how they've been controlled and even these uh, groups that you're talking about, uh, it seems at least in the last 27, eight years that I've been you know, covering um, security and politics, et cetera, it's the first time that Pakistan, um, you know, Pakistan as a pivotal state in the region, um, Marine, it's the first time that Pakistan's pivot is being deployed for something which is positive, which is uh, which is the economy, which is regional economic integration. This I hadn't, you know, and obviously it's not that it started today. It began in the last 10, 12 years. And we are moving towards a direction which seems to me in some ways uh, is very hopeful and it's there to stay and it's sustainable and it's good for the economy and it takes Pakistan away from um, security uh, perspective, which seems to be really at the core of Pakistani state outlook. I think that seems to have changed. Obviously, on the east of Pakistan, the problems continue, will continue as long as Mr. Modi is there, unless he undergoes a radical change. But on the west of Pakistan, I think it's really something to be to be uh, hopeful about. And again, I repeat, it's not something that started now. It's been happening, you know, in Afghanistan, Iran, Central Asia, CPEC, etc. And that's pretty positive. 
Declan, maybe, uh, you know, last question. Um, you were here for 10 years and, you know, you didn't even get 10 days to kind of pack up and leave. Uh, when you think about that, how does it make you feel, you know, reflecting on what happened? And also, you know, I, I keep thinking about the fact, of, of course, the, you know, the first few pages of your book are about that. What does it symbolize for you that you were asked to leave on the eve of, you know, such an important election? Uh, which, you know, as you write in your book, one that would shape the destiny of a nation. So what does that symbolize for you? Well, I mean, I'm still, uh, you know, it was, it was a, uh, honestly, it, it was a tough moment for me because I'd lived in Pakistan so long. I had, you know, I think deep roots in the country. I had a lot of friends and, uh, and to have to leave with 72 hours notice was, you know, frankly, it was, it was, it was traumatic and it was tough. But once I left and I, you know, went to London and started to, uh, uh, you know, uh, collect, you know, get, get, get stuff together again. You know, the real question then was what had prompted it. And, um, you know, that, that was really the mystery. Uh, and that's something that I write about in the book, you know, I'm trying to figure out how did, how did that happen? But I think what was probably more important than what happened just with me um, was really the fact that it was, I think in retrospect, you know, a sign of things that were to come for many Pakistani journalists who really, you know, have suffered in the years since then. And I, you know, I followed recently the drama in the middle of Islamabad with Matthew Lajan, who was picked up, um, and so many other journalists who've really, you know, had a hard time. And so I've been closely following on my colleagues, and I think, you know, they're, they're the ones who've really had a hard time. You know, as a foreigner, um, it, was, it was really difficult to leave, and it was difficult to have to leave, you know, at such short notice. Um, and, you know, I really hope that I can find a way to come back sometime soon because I, I, I would like that very much. Yeah. Well, I, I think that we're almost out of time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Declan, uh, for being here. Um, I really enjoyed your book and thank you for the surprise of being, you know, acknowledged um, in, in, in your book. And Naseem and Jugnu for your insights. I hope that our listeners were able to, got some important insights into so many problems uh, that Pakistan has, but I think that in the end, at least Jugnu and Naseem seem to be saying that they still have hope. And Declan, of course, wants to come back. So I think that, you know, uh, maybe you know, the, the good things to come. So I want to thank everyone and, uh, you know, we'll conclude our session. Thank you, everyone.